Hi folks, Dr. B. Today I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between joint types, muscles, and the types of anatomical movement that the muscle creates. So the big picture is going to be that you want to remember that every muscle is made up of long, long multinucleate cells, many cells that have fused together into those long single cells called muscle fibers. And these long cells are all arranged parallels in, in big bundles. And so each muscle is a long bundle of essentially like a stretched out or a stretchy rubber band that can shorten. And so that's all muscles can do. They can contract and pull in one direction. So in order to create movement, muscles have to cross joints. And then when they contract, they can move that joint. So then that means that the combination of where the muscle originates, where the muscle attaches, and what type of joint it's crossing is going to let you understand or predict what movement that muscle will be able to create. So let's look at this, for example, on a little skeleton. When we think about movements, a lot of time we're thinking about joints that operate on a front to back axis. And as the joint moves along this sort of front to back axis, that's going to be our flexion and extension. When the joint becomes more narrow or shortens, the angle of that joint shortens, that's going to be flexion. So flexion would be when a joint gets more narrow and closes. But when a joint goes the other direction and gets bigger, that's going to be extension. So that angle approaches vertical. And then if the joint starts bending backwards, that's hyperextension, which a few parts of your body can do. For example, if your spine bends forward, that's going to be flexion of the spine as you bow. If you stand up straight, that's going to be extension. But if you start bending your, your spine backwards, that's going to be hyperextension. So I'm gonna take these all away. Ooh, I put too many markers on here. There we go, oops, too far. All right, so let's consider some of the key joints. We've already looked a lot at um, the arm and you'll notice that here in the shoulder and here in the hip, we have a ball and socket joint. And ball and socket joints can do movement along this axis. They can do flexion and extension. Wow, I can't spell extension today. <laughs> Same thing up here. flex, extend, but these guys are multi-axial. They can also do movement on the left to right axis, side to side. So here, if a joint moves away from the body, we call that abduction, like it's being abducted or kidnapped. And if a joint moves towards the body, we call that adduction, as if it's being added onto the body. And so once again, because these are multi-axial joints, they can, both the hips and shoulders can also abduct, like you're doing jumping jacks or adduct. And multi-axial means not just two, that would be biaxial, but three potential axes. The third one is that they can rotate or twist like that around the length of their shaft. So if I take my arm and twist it, if that humerus is not lifting away, moving towards, moving forwards or backwards, but is actually twisting, that is rotation. So rotation, we can describe as, oops, I'm going a little too far here. So rotation 
can be in towards the center of the body. Whoops, that's the wrong cursor. In towards the center of the body. So that would be medial rotation. Or it can be out towards the sides of the body. That would be lateral rotation. Medial, lateral. Same thing up here, we can also rotate our humerus because we have a ball and socket joint, we can rotate it away, lateral, or we can rotate it in towards the body, medial. All right, so those are our three potential directions of motion. Now let's look at where muscles attach. Let's consider, oops, too far. Let's look at how we can then predict types of movement. So for example, when we talked about the arm, we had several muscles that crossed the elbow joint on the front of the arm. We had the biceps and brachii. We had the brachialis crossing that joint. And we had the brachioradialis crossing that joint. All of these crossed across the front of the joint. That means when they shortened, they're going to create flexion. On the opposite side of the joint, we had the triceps. on the opposite side of that hinge joint of the elbow. That means when it shortens, if it pulls on this part, pulls it this way, it's gonna create extension. So the key take home here is depending on which side of the joint we're on, the front anterior muscles created flexion. We had the biceps creating flexion by pulling this forearm and then the front muscles in the anterior compartment created flexion of the wrist and hand. On the back, posteriorly, we have all of our extensors. So the same thing is gonna be true when we look down here at the hip and knee. Anything that crosses from the front of the pelvis Anything that attaches from the front of the pelvis down onto this femur is going to be able to flex that thigh. Anything that attaches from the back of the pelvis down onto the femur is going to be able to do, nope, I've got this backwards, <laughs> because the thigh joint moves no, I have it right. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting confused because the knee is the one that goes backwards. So anything that comes back here is going to be able to help you stand up straight. That's going to be our extensors. So this is going to be standing up straight. And this is going to be lifting your leg or lifting your thigh. Because as that thigh bends up this way, that angle gets shorter, so that's flexion. As the thigh comes down to a standing position, that's extension. Down on the knee, very similar, but the knee bends a different direction. So for the knee, stuff on the back of the knee, like this, is going to be able to bend that leg backwards. And that will be, because that joint is getting smaller, that will be flexion. Stuff on the front of the knee will be able to do extension. Kicking motions, kicking your leg out. And same thing, one more step down. We can also do this to the foot. We have some special terms for the foot, but if we lift that foot up, the back of the foot up this way, that's called dorsiflexion.
um, because this is the back of the foot or the dorsal side of the foot, even though it's kind of weird, it's pointing up. If we point that toe down, this is the plantar side of the foot, like where you get plantar warts on the bottom of your foot. So that is plantar flexion. And to do plantar flexion, we're gonna to need to attach, for example, to this heel, up either to the tibia or even all the way up to the femur. For dorsiflexion, we're gonna to need to attach from the front of this foot or one of these ankle bones up onto the tibia or femur. So big take home here is that thinking about where these muscles attach is really going to help you understand what sort of movements we get. From the side view, knees, are modified hinge joints. They have a little bit of side to side, but pretty much they're not gonna move on this axis. They're not going to abduct or adduct. You don't want your knees, like, you don't want your leg to be doing that. That's concerning. <laughs> Something bad has happened. And in fact, that's how people often tear tendons, like an ACL tear, is they get a hard blow to the side of their knee and that pu pushes the tibia sideways and breaks some tendons in the knee. So we don't want that. So knees aren't gonna move in this direction, but the hips, these ball and socket joints here, are going to be able to move side to side, basically doing the splits. So if we move the hips out, again, that's abduction. If we move them in, that's going to be adduction. So in order to move them out, we're going to want to attach from the lateral side of the pelvis somewhere onto this femur. To adduct, our adductor muscles are mostly going to be on the inside of our thighs. They're going to attach to the inside of our pelvis and do adduction and help us stand up straight by pulling our legs together and keeping them underneath us. So again, big take home here is look at the way the joint is structured and where the muscle originates and inserts and then you can understand what sort of movements it's allowing. Now, we can also get some rotation in this ball and socket joint. And so the rotation is going to require us to really get somewhere over here on the side of the bone or on the inside. So either the lateral surface of the bone or the medial surface. And if we pull it towards the front, we may be able to do medial rotation. If we pull it towards the back, that will be lateral rotation. So a lot of these um, flexors and extensors, and also a lot of these abductors, depending on where they insert, can also do a little bit of rotation in there. So uh, one other thing we'll look at is if we look at a muscle that crosses from the tibia and crosses over to the big toe, our anterior tibialis, that crossing is going to be able to not only dorsiflex the foot upwards because we're shortening up this direction, but it's also gonna pull the foot this way. And that is going to be, um, let's see, everting the foot, inverting the foot. So we can also twist those, foot, those foots, <laughs> feet along those joints as well. All right, those were the things I wanted to talk about for this little mini lecture, um, is just to think about where muscles attach and connect that to the different motions you see, especially when we look at these more complicated leg muscles. All right, see you next time.